It is important to note that even though Anna Marcos died in 352 BC, the Third Sacred War would rage on for another six years, all the way up until 346 BC. The Phocians continued to raid the Temple of Apollo to pay their mercenary army. This allowed the Phocians to attack Boeotia over and over. For his part, Philip had not involved himself in the war anymore after his victory at Crocus Field. Apparently, it was not in Philip's best interest to end the war outright. And why not? After all, his territory was unaffected by the war. And the conflict only served to weaken the rest of Greece, while his army gained in prestige and influence. The Thebans often appealed to Philip for aid, but Philip only dispatched token forces to assist his allies. Nothing substantial enough that would help finally end the conflict. Meanwhile, Philip chose to concentrate up north. Thrace and the Chalcidice were once again problem areas, and there were still some potential rivals to his throne that needed to be dealt with. And of course, the war with Athens continued. Athens remained master of the sea, while Philip possessed a more formidable land army, even more so with the recent addition of Thessaly. However, as long as the Athenians were able to hold the pass at Thermopylae, it would be very difficult to launch any serious attack to the south. Athens continued to dispatch generals to Thrace, which caused problems for Philip. It is widely believed that Philip campaigned in Thrace in 352 BC after his victory over the Phocians. However, very little is known about the campaign, or even what the Macedonians were able to achieve. Next, Philip concentrated on the Chalcidice. First, the Chalcidice had made peace with Athens. Also, according to Justin, two of his rivals to the throne fled to Olynthos for protection. In the summer of 349 BC, Philip's army was once again on the move. Philip first concentrated on the smaller cities in an effort to cut off the largest and most significant city in the Chalcidice, Olynthos. Justin writes, quote, In the next place, as if he had done everything well, he crossed over into the Chalcidice, where, conducting his wars with equal deceitfulness and treacherously capturing or killing the neighboring princes, he united the whole of the province to the kingdom of Macedonia. End quote. One year later, in 348 BC, and with nearly all the cities back under Macedon's influence, Philip could now concentrate on Olynthos. Diodorus writes, quote, He first defeated the Olynthians in two battles, and confined them to the defense of their walls. Then, in the continuous assaults that he made, he lost many of his men in encounters at the walls, but finally bribed the chief officials of the Olynthians, and captured Olynthus through treachery. After plundering it and enslaving the inhabitants, he sold both men and property as booty. By doing so, he procured large sums for prosecuting the war and intimidated the other cities that were opposed to him. Having rewarded with appropriate gifts such soldiers as had behaved gallantly in the battle and distributed a sum of money to men of influence in the cities, he gained many tools ready to betray their countries. Indeed, he was wont to declare that it was far more by the use of gold than of arms that he had enlarged his kingdom. After the capture of Olynthus, he celebrated the Olympian festival to the gods in commemoration of his victory, and offered magnificent sacrifices, and he organized a great festive assembly at which he held splendid competitions, and thereafter invited many of the visiting strangers to his banquets. In the course of the carousels, he joined in numerous conversations, presenting to many guests drinking cups as he proposed the toasts, awarding gifts to a considerable number, and graciously making such handsome promises to them all that he won over a large number to crave friendship with him. End quote. The defeat of the Olynthians shook Athens to the core. There was the real prospect the war might spill into Attica itself. Diodorus writes, quote, Since the Athenians viewed with alarm the rising power of Philip, they came to the assistance of any people who were attacked by the king, by sending envoys to cities and urging them to watch over their independence and punish with death those citizens who were bent on treason. And they promised them all they would fight as their allies, and after publicly declaring themselves the king's enemies, engaged in an out-and-out -out war against Philip. The man who more than any other spurred them on to take up the cause of Hellas was the orator Demosthenes, the most eloquent of the Greeks of those times. End quote. Still, the Athenians began to look for a way out of the war. Previously, the Athenian assembly had rejected peace from anyone that proposed it. But a leadership change in Phocis changed all of that in 346 BC. 
In a bizarre move, the new leader refused to let the Athenians and Spartans occupy the all-important pass at Thermopylae. Worse yet, Philip threatened an invasion from the north. Athens finally had enough and sent envoys to Philip, and in turn Philip dispatched his own ambassadors to the Athenian assembly. Justin indicates the terms of the peace treaty were advantageous to both Macedon and Athens, and with that the Third Sacred War was finally over. The terms imposed on Phocis were extremely harsh. Phocian cities would be destroyed, and Phocis would be stripped of its seat on the Amphictyonic Consul. It was left to Philip to enforce that part of the treaty. Justin writes, The Phocians in consequence, finding themselves overreached by the cunning of Philip, were the first in great trepidation to take arms. But there was no time to make due preparation for war or to collect troops, and Philip, unless a surrender should be made, threatened their destruction. Overcome, accordingly by necessity, they submitted, stipulating only for their lives. But this stipulation was just as faithfully observed by Philip as his promises had been respecting the war which they had deprecated. They were everywhere put to the sword, or made prisoners. Children were not left to their parents, nor wives to their husbands, nor the statue of the gods in the temples. The sole comfort of the wretched people was that, as Philip had defrauded his allies of their share of the spoil, they saw none of their property in the hands of their enemies. End quote. We will continue on in the next video.